Professor Newman, I had to cut you off there. Uh, please continue with your answer. Sure. So I was just saying that Dakota communities that had what's sometimes called traditional territory within Canada that they were utilizing in some way um, uh, that may now be located entirely in the United States in the case of some of those Dakota communities and their Dakota communities in Canada as well. Um, well, in some cases, um, you could have questions about whether what they were doing constitute occupying land or simply using it, uh, and the courts would have to wrestle with those. Um, so there is a hurdle, um, and I don't want to exaggerate the hurdle, but I don't want to understate it either. Um, uh, there, there is a legal test for what communities would be able to put claims in Canada today. Uh, it's just a, it's not one that says that those located entirely outside Canada can't put claims. Uh, where where do you think it goes from here, uh, based on the on the movement of the jurisprudence and uh, this latest case? What what happens next? Do you think? Well, I think we're seeing a, a lot of new litigation around Indigenous rights issues uh, in recent years. So there'd been a period where a lot was on the duty to consult, and we're now seeing a lot of litigation in lower courts. Uh, that's getting back to issues of Aboriginal title, Aboriginal rights, treaty rights. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, I, I guess based on this decision, there's the possibility uh, for some of that litigation to involve communities located entirely outside Canada for those issues to be raised in consultation. And we have a whole set of new issues arising uh, as the federal government moves forward in relation to the new UNDRIP legislation, the legislation mm -hmm. concerning the implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I'm referring to it shorthand when I say about implementation, there are specific statutory obligations there, as well as policy directions the federal government will take. BC has similar legislation. They're wrestling with what they're going to do under it. And I think we have a, a lot of Indigenous policy issues on the agenda ahead, many of which affect business um, in various complex ways, and business can't be um, uh, ignoring these issues. They're, they're, they're things to be considered in nuanced and sophisticated ways for those who are going to succeed in the Canadian economic context. Yeah, let's just unpack that for a bit. We've got a couple of minutes left here. So uh, how do you, if, you know, I know you're not, you're not acting as a business person, you're you're, uh, you're analyzing as a professor of law, but presumably this does change the strategies as they, as they see the motion of, of how the law is going. It does change the strategy of, of businesses involved in resource extraction, for instance. It certainly does. And obviously one of the ways that businesses may respond is engaging and working with indigenous communities that are enthusiastic about development and economic opportunities that that brings. And so we've seen the recent uh, announcement of um, intentions by Indigenous communities to invest in the coastal gas link pipeline, for example. Uh, something like that may pursue an alignment of interests that uh, gets around government in some ways. Right. Um, we'll see other businesses that may decide that the uncertainties that are developing are simply too much right. um, for them to be involved. Uh, and uh, we probably don't read all of those stories because what's the story when someone decides not to invest in Canada? It's not really necessarily a story at all, um, other than one that's to the detriment of the Canadian economy. Um, and we'll see a lot of other businesses, I think, that are watching carefully and uh, need to try to uh, project where the law is going over the coming decades. And in some of my classes, uh, working with law students that are going to be advising these businesses uh, in the decades ahead. I, I'm always telling them they need to think about not just where the law is today, but where the law might be 20 or 30 years out for certain kinds of resource projects that actually have that kind of lifespan, uh, not just in development, but in production. And uh, if the law shifts in that time, uh, they may need to take account of that. And I mean, uh, as a, a lawyer, I, mean, I guess it's okay that there's a legal industry that makes some money. Uh, from a Canadian economic standpoint, it's too bad we have to spend more and more money on uh, on lawyers. Um, and uh, But there are some complexities that we're navigating uh, between a, a lot of different interests at stake.